thought I'd already did that. Okay, so now we have uh, Tim Fowler and Bart Snap to talk about Chimera. Uh, I'm going to start with a poll asking if you have heard about LaTeX. So if you could fill out a yes, no, or sounds vaguely familiar, and I'm going to let uh, Bart and Tim get started. Hello. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Just give me a second. Or one of your screens. Yeah, I'm going to try. Let's see if I can find it. There's so many screens. Uh huh. This is the right one to share. All right. How does that look to everybody? Can you see? Uh, can you see that and read it? Okay. Yes. Excellent. So Premier 2.0. Uh, so I'm Bart Snap and Jim Fowler. I'm Jim. <laughs> and uh, we want to thank Danny for inviting us to present. So uh, Chimera is a is a free open source uh, set of tools designed to um, help authors write interactive textbooks, and it's based on LaTeX. And as we look at the polls. It looks like uh, about half of us know what LaTeX is, and the other half say no or sounds vaguely familiar. So uh, here's the uh, LaTeX webpage, and it's like a programming language designed for making PDFs. You could think of it like HTML, if you're, you know, in terms of making web pages, except that LaTeX a lot older. <laughs> right, right. It's quite old. It, predates the internet. Now, uh, you might think, who's, who's using this? Well, if you look, you know, spring 2021, uh, LaTeX release available, it's quite uh, active. And on the uh, preprint archive, I, I hope we know what that is, uh, you know, it's where people post their poster papers, nearly every paper here is written, at least in mathematics and physics, in tech. About how, Jim, do you have any idea how many papers that is? A million. <laughs> There's a lot, certainly, of There's stuff that's been written in, in tech, yeah. And so ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is take any tech document and make minor modifications to it and then put it online as an interactive uh, document where you can even record uh, inputs from the user who's reading the page. Um, I think okay, part so, of the benefit here is that you know our faculty are already writing stuff in in this system, you know, because they're writing the research in papers, tech, law tech systems in law tech, and they're uh, they're writing the, the often the the books are also written in this, including uh, existing OER resources are often written using using law tech, uh, and that helps if you're trying to produce PDFs to share with with your students, but it's. Not as helpful if you wanted to have a, a, some kind of interaction with the students or, or track their usage even of the of the resource, say in, in Canvas. That's right. And so uh, I think in 2013, a, a lot, even before 2013, we were working on Chimera, working on this idea of turning LaTeX documents into interactive textbooks. And around 2013, uh, I was teaching calculus, or no, maybe, yeah, 20, I was teaching calculus one, and uh, I put together a very quick uh, calculus book that semester. We did lots of studies in the math department, uh, checking uh, student outcomes with various uh, resources, including proprietary textbooks, proprietary online homework systems. And what we found from our study is that the students in the free open source Chimera class who only had the textbook that I put together that semester, along with the interactive tools that I put together that semester, uh, did as well as the students who had uh, the proprietary textbook and proprietary homework systems. Would you like to say something about that, Jim? Well, they certainly didn't do any worse. And to me, that's the main the main feature, because at least this system is not only free to the students in terms of how much cash they're they're paying up, but it's also free in the sense of freedom, uh, you know, in that instead of, say, a commercial publisher producing the textbook and then we're asking the students to use even a free book from a commercial publisher. 
uh, you know, here the actual content is controlled by by faculty. The assessments controlled by by faculty. Uh, you know, I think that's an important distinction to to be making. Absolutely. And once we got the the course up, it integrate we could integrate it into Carmen. And on the right here, I have uh, an example Carmen page from a previous course. And if we go to assignments. And we scroll down to one of the previous assignments. I don't know, homework 28, I guess. We launch this homework 28. We'll see our exercises here. And when I click on them, um, I get an answer box and I can type something. And I don't think five's not correct here. And of course, you mean you, you could embed a quiz and a picture in Canvas too, but this answer box actually knows some mathematics which is extremely valuable because uh, Canvas's ability to decide whether an answer is correct is somewhat suspect if the students are inputting uh, you know, complicated mathematical expressions. So being able to build sort of a computer algebra system on top of this that, that is easy for instructors to get answers into uh, and then get grades out of you know, is a big, big payoff for this thing. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing is that you know, like we said, we built this in LaTeX, so we always get a PDF of our stuff. And that might not seem like such a big deal, but when we move to an all online presentation, it's common to have some sort of technical difficulty. And the PDF gives the teacher, the instructor, a fallback that's going to work, that's going to be reasonable for their students, even if the technology fails for a short amount of time, which even with proprietary software, we find that that happens every semester. Well, and even if you think the technology is going to last forever, I mean, just being able to tell faculty, you know, you're not doing an investment in writing content in some proprietary system, you're writing content in LaTeX, which you know is going to work forever, you know, because it's been working since the 1970s, which is forever. Right. You know, and if some technology has survived since the 1970s, it's probably going to keep on surviving. Uh, you know, and it's important because otherwise, you know, if you ask instructors to build a lot of content and build beautiful courses in Canvas, at some point, Canvas will be replaced with, with something else. And then you have to hope that you're going to be able to export it into IMSCC or something and re-import it, and it's going to look okay. So. To give you an example, uh, this is, oops, this is, oops, put that back up there. This is the um, uh, the PDF of the answer of, of the file, and then here's the online version. If now here, are, there's an answer on that PDF. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I can hide that answer to make it a uh, honest handout for my students. And you might say, well, that's just a page with one problem on it. Yeah, yeah. But I can put all the problems together and a whole collection of pages, pass them out, have the students work on them in class if I want to, and then say, go home and, and put your answers in the online system and see what happens. And, and that's like a really powerful way uh, to use this in a class. And at least okay. it avoids having to hand grade hundreds of assignments. Absolutely. One of the, the fun features at Ohio State are the 3,000 students we have in these courses. So we have to have some solution that that not only, uh, you know, is a great, I think, educational experience for the, for the learners, but also scales so that we're not completely inundated with, you know, thousands and thousands of pieces of paper. Absolutely. And so like Jim was saying, uh, I might be hesitant to write 100 quizzes in Carmen because I have no confidence that my quizzes are going to work in five years. Um, but tech being around for 30 years and the fact that it's going to give me a PDF no matter what gives me a lot of confidence that the content that I'm writing will still be useful to me in some way. It's four, 40 years, really. Yeah, right, right. It's approaching. It just, keeps on getting longer. How old are we? Yeah. Right, right. That's right. So um, let me give you sort of an idea of how this works by looking at getting started. We have this really wonderful picture here that basically, I think, explains a lot of stuff. So make sure. The idea is that the author will write some LaTeX. 
and then they can produce a book out of this if they want to. And I and do that, that's a workflow they're already doing. Right, they're already doing this without Chimera around. And all we're asking them to do is change one line of their file from article to Chimera. And then we uh, push it to GitHub. Do we, we should have done a GitHub. See if people know what GitHub is. GitHub is an online repository for code. It was designed uh, to manage writing the Linux kernel. And we're using it to write math books. And it allows people to simultaneously work on documents and not overwrite each other's work. That's the it, idea. It is an interesting thing. Cause I mean, I, I think as, as much as maybe I'm a tech maximalist, I'm even more of a GitHub maximalist. And I, I think that can be a little, little bit off-putting, but I, I do wanna push people on the idea that uh, writing a mathematics textbook even if you're just writing the words and you're not really thinking about the equation, so to speak. I mean, if you're just thinking about trying to manage manage that, it's a lot more like writing software than it is like writing a, a prose novel. You know, because there's there's a lot of cross referencing, which you know is a lot like function calls or something. There's a lot of questions about modules. You know, you think about refactoring sections in the book the same way that you might be refactoring code. And a lot of the changes that happen to pieces of a mathematics textbook that like some piece of OER that you're collaborating on end up changing multiple files. So sometimes we get pushback and people are like, well, why don't I just use Dropbox? Everyone wants to use Dropbox to share, but in Dropbox does do versioning, but Dropbox versions individual files maybe, but trying to manage sort of the fact that I'm gonna change this file which also has to then change in concert with this other file for that to really make sense uh, is, is complicated. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of benefits actually to getting people more comfortable with, with Git. It's also, I'd argue, uh, sort of a, a skill that's uh, valuable in the, in the workforce anyhow. So I mean, a lot of people who are gonna go out and do things with code in some sense. So I mean, they're STEM majors, they're almost surely gonna be using computers, even if they're not writing code for, the world at large, they're going to be writing scripts and doing data analysis or something. Having the skills to be able to collaborate on GitHub, you know, is really a, a tool that makes it possible uh, for, for teams to manage the, the complexity of, of things like software. So it's the sort of tool set that we should be training our students in anyway. And certainly if, you know, our students are expecting this as sort of a life skill, our faculty should also know how to use Git. Uh, so we've been, we have been running, you know, like kind of get for authors, get for faculty stuff at the, at some of our workshops. And I mean, that's, uh, I think an important skill anyhow, you know, and has a lot of, a lot of benefits. It certainly enables me to feel better when I'm just doing my own work. And if I'm writing a paper with somebody, I'm going to put that paper in a Git repository anyhow. And then I feel freer just to delete stuff because I know I can go back. I can use git blame. So when my, my co-author says, did, did you write this? Then I can type git blame and say, no, it was actually you that wrote this on this date. You know, and that's always a really positive conversation I'm sure to have. Uh, but it's a, there's a lot I think to be, to be gained by sort of having kind of more robust tools for doing this kind of collaboration. And git is certainly, I think the winner um, in this sort of source version control uh, space right now. Yeah, and in fact, I might say something a little bit stronger. I've been using uh, version control since I was in grad school, and there are different programs that do this. One was what CVS, uh, SVN, and SVN, CVS, yes, and then Git. And all I can say is Dropbox is not in any way, shape, or form a replacement for this. You know, it does not do the same things. You will overwrite other people's files. And we currently have some people who are working in Dropbox and in Git. And I, uh, it's not so easy for them to do that. If they just did it all in Git, I think it would be a little bit easier. Although it is a little bit scary to use Git sometimes. I, there's, I mean, there's certainly an onboarding process that the Git, I mean, I think LaTeX is something where the math faculty are gonna be comfortable using LaTeX, certainly physics and computer science to some extent then also. But I mean, the Git is something that a lot of the faculty are gonna be more hesitant to, to use. But I think it's a really powerful thing to enable OER and collaboration on OER. So. 
Right. And the first, the first really online thing that we did was uh, when Jim was the instructor for the massive open online calculus. And this is, in some sense, a precursor, again, to Chimera, where Jim uh, was the instructor, and you made a lot of videos, Jim. Uh, I wrote a precursor, a precursor to the calculus book that was used uh, for Chimera. And then Steve Gupkin wrote a bunch of exercises. And after that, we decided that using Git was great for all of this and made, made it possible. Uh, but we really wanted everything in one place. We wanted videos and exercises and uh, textbook content all at the same location was the idea. And so we have our GitHub repo, Muculus. It's not calculus, it's Muculus. And the, the thought here was nobody uses the word Muculus so that we can have it. And as you can see, here our texts are, this is our calculus book and all the files that go with the calculus book up here. And then we have pre-calc, math for architects, advanced geometry, engineering technology, history of mathematics. This is a linear algebra course. And all these people, these are all the different faculty who uh, can contribute to these various texts. And they don't have to talk to us to do it. They can just make changes. And then when I'm on my computer, if something goes wrong, I can either undo those changes or see exactly who made it and say, oh, don't do that again. Or maybe that was a great idea. Do more of that. That's sort of the idea. I mean, so, I mean, it's not like Wikipedia, you know, where no. anybody can go in and edit anything. You have to give them permission. So um, that's the idea of Chimera. And so we, we send it to GitHub and then OSU servers look at those GitHub files and they transform them into HTML files. Do you want to say something about that, Jim? Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I think, a mysterious process <laughs> to say, to say the least. Um, so we've, I mean, over the last uh, almost decade, you know, we've tried different ways of taking LaTeX and putting the LaTeX on, on web pages. So one of these ways is uh, a tool called Pandoc, which is, uh, I think, a useful tool anyway for converting between different, yeah. uh, different formats. Uh, that you know has some limitations. So uh, you know, then we uh, got rid of, of Pandoc and we started using a different tool called Tech for HT, which is a uh, system for converting LaTeX to HTML. It was developed um, by a, uh, a professor at Ohio State um, who who unfortunately passed away rather young because it would have been really helpful if he was here so he could help us. Um, but uh, that that system uh, does does convert LaTeX to to HTML. Uh, it's I'd say challenging to use, and it's it's hard maybe to maintain. Um, we also sort of struggle with the fact that the servers were doing this this conversion. Maybe this is kind of in the weeds, but I think it's helpful to get some some perspective for how this has worked over the years. Uh, you know, the, the, the servers were doing this, this conversion from, from uh, LaTeX to HTML so we can put it up on web pages. At some point, we then uh, sort of found that that was hard because sometimes when you're editing a LaTeX document, it's a lot like writing code and there's a, kind of an edit compile run cycle that people get into. So you're writing your LaTeX document, you might make a typo, a syntax error, right? Which, you know, maybe in Microsoft Word doesn't do too much, but in you know LaTeX, if you make a syntax error, like your document will not will not appear correctly. So it's important for you to be running the LaTeX program or using some sort of tool that ensures that your uh, your input is valid. But if the server is doing the conversion, then that takes away uh, kind of a, a point where the uh, author can sort of see what the content's gonna, gonna look like. So we ended up replacing that with a different system where, uh, where the authors compile the, uh, the content on their own computers using their own LaTeX ins installation, using some additional tools that we, that we provide. And that's what we've been doing for the last, uh, I don't know, five years, I guess, using a tool called, called Cake which is a kind of a build tool for, um, for uh, uh, Chimera. Yeah, so type permissions, you don't actually have to pay anything to, to GitHub. I mean, GitHub's um, business model is something, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about. It is owned by Microsoft now. 
uh, which is funny, I think, given you know the ancient perspective of Microsoft as the evil empire, but now they're more like the rebellion in the Star Wars narrative that is the open source world. Uh, and GitHub uh, lets you create unlimited uh, public repositories, and it, the people who who see your content do not have the permission to to edit your content, but they can fork that content and then make a pull request, which is a request that you would integrate their changes into your copy. And this is great because it means that you know random student finds a typo, they click a button, they create this pull request, and then that gets integrated into the into the original version. And I, I put up like all my course material anyway on GitHub, and then my students will fix the typos in my problem sets just by submitting pull requests, which is definitely better than having to receive an email and figure out where to make the change and then make the change. And it also creates sort of a, a celebration of their own you know, engagement with the course in some public place. And for people who are interested in a public portfolio that demonstrates you know, how much they're engaging with the course, you know, that can be a, a positive thing as well. Um, I know the other thing maybe to, to say about all of these different systems for transforming LaTeX to HTML, uh, you know, is that uh, it, it's maybe part of the, the promise uh, for, uh, for this entire enterprise that the author can write something in LaTeX and then somehow it's going to appear on the, on the internet. And the fact that it's gone through multiple different backends, I mean, starting with, with Pandoc and then servers that are running LaTeX and now people, the, the authors who are running LaTeX on their own computers to do the conversion to HTML, and now this new thing, Chimera 2.0, you know, the fact that all of these systems have existed with the same uh, source code behind it, you know, I think is, is part of the sense in which, uh, you know, Chimera has fulfilled the promise of being uh, and the separation of, of content and, and deployment. So the authors, faculty who are creating the OER, uh, you know, can write stuff in, in LaTeX. And they don't really have to understand or worry, how is this ever going to be converted to appear on a, on a screen? You know, because frankly, a decade ago when we started doing this, I, I think even the idea that you would do this on a mobile phone wasn't a realistic thing. I mean, 10 years ago, we were really targeting iPads primarily uh, as kind of the place where, where we were kind of the device on which we imagine people would be engaging with this. Um, you know, so we've already seen kind of changes as to the sorts of devices on which students might want to engage with this um, over, over the years. Jim, did you answer this question to have permissions feature would that require a paid version of GitHub? Yeah, so I think the, I mean, the idea there is, is you you can permit people to, uh, you know, pe people cannot just edit your repositories oh. without without you accepting yeah. their their request, but they but they can make a copy of your work. Well, well, and the I fact think, that all the content is public does creep some people out. I mean, that is I, something to think about. I mean, I think the answer is no to have the permissions feature. Right, you absolutely don't yeah. have to pay. No, yeah. no, you yeah. do not have to have a, paid version of GitHub. Yeah, you do have I, to pay GitHub if you want private or secret repositories that you can collaborate on. Now, that's kind of confusing because there's a, I mean, uh, this is like so far down. So, I mean, there's a there's a, also a difference between Git and GitHub. So GitHub's a commercial product that's, you know, supported by, by Microsoft. Uh, Git is sort of the underlying technology, which is just an open source, you know, piece of software that you can install. You can create your own Git repositories. Yeah, okay, so Jason is explaining this on, on your computer uh, without involving GitHub at all. Um, but it does, it does, I think, make it easier, certainly, if you're trying to collaborate with somebody to use something like, like GitHub. Ohio State has, uh, I think it's GitLab installed also, you know, so th those are private repositories that faculty can create to collaborate with other faculty at Ohio State, which is using Git, but not the commercial GitHub product. Anyway, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, this is trying to paint the landscape to give people an idea how this, these pieces fit together. But. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I don't pay for GitHub at all. Yeah, so and I there's also an educator discount. If, if right. you send in like evidence that you're at a university, they'll they'll just give you free private repos too. That's right. I've done that. So let me show you kind of how easy it is to, to make like a question like this. If we, we could if we could just append the word tech to the end and see the code. Now this looks really scary, but uh <laughs> it also this, groups people out that the students can see the source code. Oh yeah. That's a different discussion. Well, it's open source, <laughs> right? So uh, this is this is just drawing that picture, that picture that you saw 
this is drawing the picture. And yeah, that's a little bit hard, but people who write in tech have ways of drawing pictures. But the actual question is just this, compute. And then we're like the integral of this. And then we have answer. And we tell it what the answer is. And then when we go back to the exercise, was it minus 57 over two? I, I got to say too, I definitely encourage people to do these the so-called source level graphics. So if you're going to draw a, a picture, it's a good idea to learn one of these systems for, for LaTeX because, um, you know, like an experience here, uh, at one point a decade ago, you might have wanted this picture to be a PDF, uh, but now, you know, you're going to want this picture to be something else. You potentially want it to be different sizes on a phone. Uh, you know, so being able to describe the picture in some way that different programs can digest that picture and do something appropriate with it is, is certainly valuable. In the first versions of Chimera, we, we produced pings and sent rasterized images over to the client. Now we produce SVGs and provide SVGs to the client, which definitely looks better for people with uh, high DPI displays. Um, so again, there's this sort of promise that the authors write what they intend, and then we figure out how best to display it uh, you know, based on the kind of current technology that's available, I think is a, another good example in this you know, source level graphics. So, I mean, I don't know, Tick Z can be, the pictures can be scary looking, but it's not, not, not the worst part probably of Latte. Right. So after doing this for a while, are we ready to start talking about Chimera 2.0 or do we have any more things we want to say about cake and stuff like that, Jim? So o Overleaf is a, is a good example. So Overleaf is a, um, a platform that you can use to write uh, LaTeX. And uh, it's kind of interesting because you can, you can write in, oh, Jason's got a good point here too. You can, yeah. you can write uh, LaTeX code in a web browser and then compile it and see the output also in, in the web browser without having to install LaTeX. I mean, a full LaTeX install is, is maybe a couple of gigabytes of hard drive space. So that's not the sort of thing. It might be hard to convince a random student to, um, to uh, do something in, uh, uh, on, their, on their own computer, but it's easy enough to convince some student to, to make an Overleaf project and then you can share it. And Overleaf also connects to, uh, to Git. Right, that's right. You could write, you could author an Overleaf is just fine. But Overleaf, Overleaf is not a way to deploy your finished book to, to, to students. I mean, unless you want to give them a PDF. Which... Right. Uh, it's a way to collaboratively write something, which is solved by Git, even using Overleaf. You just don't see that you're solving it with Git. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. And then the, uh, got a point here, yeah. The answer. OK, so how does it go from knowing uh that you typed in something to knowing that the answer is right yeah what what if you type in something else in that in that box x now the first thing i want to show you uh is that as you type it tries to guess what you're typing and then it tells you what it thinks you're typing because you know students are who knows what they're typing, it thinks I'm typing this, and I can check it, and it says that's wrong. And uh, here, you wrote the back end, you know. Well, I, so I would say I I do think sometimes people people get frustrated that the input is is that way. There is there is a math palette at the top. If you click on that magic wand, you'll get to a place where you can, um, uh, yeah, use the sort of math palette input thing. Um, I, I actually like the fact that it's a text box because I, I think there's something to be gained by by making sure that students can can input mathematics into a web page because a lot of I mean, insofar as people are going to do something with numbers, they're all again almost surely going to have to explain that thing to a computer. So making sure that they can communicate a mathematical function to the computer is itself a valuable thing. So I'm not I don't feel too bad about that. Uh, and then certainly what whether or not the math the you know, the input the student gets is is correct or not you know is uh is also very important um i think there's a lot of uh examples on the internet where um students are paying a lot of money for a commercial product 
uh, and then they input a an answer which is correct into the into the input box, and the commercial product which they pay a lot of money for, uh, then says no, you're wrong. You know, and I think that's a very dehumanizing experience uh, for for the learner um, because you know, I mean, they obviously they maybe they're correct, you know, and then that's that can be very a very frustrating feeling that they have to try to convince the machine that they're that they're correct. Uh, now, you know, the, the challenge here is, is really that um, it's quite difficult for machines to determine whether or not uh, two mathematical expressions are, are the same. So, I mean, so difficult, you know, in the sense that you can describe the mathematical challenge of this with, with uh, you know, ver you know, various mathematics has been done to study the problem of whether or not you can determine if two mathematical expressions are, are equal. What does that even mean? Uh, so that's you know maybe a bit of a of a delicate question. And the the goal I, here. I'd like to interrupt is, for just a second. Oh yeah, go on. Uh, go and that might sound it. easy, you know. Tell me if this is right, <laughs> but it's not because the language of mathematics is too imprecise to clearly delineate between two different things, right? I mean that's that's basically. Yeah, I mean it's not a it's not a decidable question whether or not these expressions are equal, which is frustrating certainly so we have we have to rely on heuristics you know we've got a, a few thousand uh cases of things that we think should be equal and things that we sh that shouldn't be equal and we write an engine that then determines whether or not these things are equal or not i mean that that kind of kind of computer algebra system on the back end is something that canvas do really doesn't supply so i mean even if you tried to do these kinds of mathematical inputs in canvas i mean you can definitely check whether or not the student inputs x plus sign x shift six two you know but whether or not they input something that's equivalent to that you know is is a is a challenge and i mean here you know the answer uh you know is a fraction so then whether or not they input something as a, a decimal and whether you want these things to be equal is you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot maybe to be said about answer validation and that's you know a one big big component of this uh, of this enterprise being able to make it easy for faculty to produce a worksheet that's got some answer blanks and then get students to engage with those and check if the answers are the same, whatever that means, uh, you know, is definitely a big, big payoff here. That's what we're trying to trying to make easier. Now, unfortunately, uh, our tool cake seemed to be somewhat difficult to install sometimes. Yeah, that's an understatement, I would say. Right. And um, Part of that is that many, everybody's computer is, believe it or not, subtly different. And sometimes these small differences make big issues happen. And this uh, is why you know, web apps are popular because the web provides sort of a consistent operating system for, for computers nowadays. That's the same across uh, lots of different kinds of machines and different scales of machines, you know, web, web browsers on phones, on tablets, on desktops on mainframes, I suppose. Yeah, and installing LaTeX on Windows is, is not super easy. And um, yeah, oh, wow. All right, yeah. Well, we can try. I think it should mark it as correct, minus 59 plus. Yeah, right. This is a different answer that it has to know some stuff. Anyways. Should we talk about the origins of Chimera 2.0, Jim? Now that yeah, fun. maybe um, maybe going to the the first link, the tech link is a, is a good on. example. So this is let's say our competitor to Overleaf. <laughs> so. um, I, I I still think this solves a fundamentally different problem than Overleaf. Overleaf is a way to. I, I just want to make this very clear because we go to a lot of meetings and somebody says, "Well, what's the difference between Chimera and MathJax?" Right. And see, MathJax is a way to embed math into HTML. So you would be writing a giant HTML book. And then uh, you can put some math in. But we don't want to write our book in HTML. We want to write it in LaTeX because we already write books in LaTeX. Nobody, no mathematicians don't write stuff in HTML usually. They write a lot of stuff in LaTeX. So um, Jim wanted a way to collaborate with mostly Ross students. Isn't that right, Jim? 
Yeah, the, the goal here was to, to make it easier for, for students uh, and me to, to collaboratively write uh, LaTeX documents together. Right. Uh, and this, this lets people, you know, if you go to tech.rossprogram.org slash chimera to talk, you, you too can edit this document with us in, in real time. Uh, and, and then if you part. click this little play button, it will compile the document. Uh-oh. Oh, I put Chimera in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's kind of, this only works with the article class, but it's it's a good example. Now, I mean, just from a technical point of view, um, the uh, the the back end that's being used by by Overleaf is uh, is actually running LaTeX on servers that Overleaf the Overleaf Corporation uh, you know controls. This this web page tech.rossprogram.org is uh, is not is not like that. Um, this this web page actually doesn't have any server that's that's compiled this this LaTeX. Uh, this this compilation is happening in the in this case Bart's web browser. Uh, when when he clicks on that on that play button, it's actually compiling LaTeX uh, inside his his web browser. Uh, and then rendering it also inside his his web browser, uh, and you can see that he's yeah, he's made that text uh, huge and bold, and it's yeah. um, it's working. <laughs> so. And and this was really this is goes back to our first days working with the massive open online calculus course because if you have fifty thousand students, you are going to have trouble having a server that's going to survive when they all go there at the same time. Even Ohio State's, you know, uh, 6,000 or so Calc 1 students would bring Pearson's uh, proprietary stuff that, to a grinding halt in the first week until somehow they got more servers or something. But by doing a client side, we have, we use the student's own computer to do the hard work. So, um, Jim, there's, made. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna. I mean, there's there's some other kind of funny, um, funny things here. Like maybe if you make the font a little bit larger, it it might be easier to see the the tech side too. That's something I can't control re remotely. Um, but like here's a a direct JS command, for instance. Um, oh, I'll, and, I'll run it. Yeah see if this i'm always just so utterly terrified of um let me do whoops i got it let's try yeah, jim's typing that i want to point that out like no hands <laughs> yeah it's on my screen okay he's so typing. so then um if you compile it again bart there. You may want to refresh the page also. I should maybe warn you this this thing. It worked. Yeah, there you go. So it DirectJS is is actually executing JavaScript code in this page and then outputting it to to the to the to the tech uh, document as well. So this is the sort of thing that um, would be challenging in uh, in something like uh, like like Overleaf. So maybe the use case to think about here is a situation where you want to produce um, an exercise that has some some random number in it. Uh, right. So a common desire and is to write a, a homework exercise where students would get different versions of the exercise with different random parameters. Uh, you can do this with tools like Lua LaTeX, which is, um, let me type that in here. Uh, which is a different language, language called Lua that's then glued on top of LaTeX. Um, and maybe a challenge there is just that Lua is not as popular as, as JavaScript. I think at this point, JavaScript is the, the world's most popular programming language. Um, you know, and it's sort of the, the one place on a modern computer where everybody can click on the console in the web browser and get to a programming prompt without actually having to install anything, you know, and that kind of harkens back to, uh, you know, the Halcyon uh, days when you would turn on a computer and a basic prompt would appear 
and you could program the computer and users were expected to be to be programmers. JavaScript, at least, is a, is a point where where that kind of programming interface is still is still broadly visible and installed because everyone's got a web browser and they've all got the web inspector or some sort of on a computer at least they've got the web inspector and they can program something in javascript so it's a very popular language so the hope is to be able to uh empower people to write not only latex documents but latex documents that have things like javascript in them uh you know the same way that uh, html can have javascript in it uh to do various automated and interactive things so this is maybe a, a demo of uh, you know that that sort of thing um, working. Uh, you know maybe to convince you that it's um, yeah I don't know. So I mean it's you know I think this this kind of thing is is surprising that it uh, that it works at all to me mostly, um, but it really is running in the in in the client's um, browser you know as opposed to running on a on a server somewhere. So let's should we show them? Let's show them uh, the the new stuff now, or the old stuff. Yeah, that sounds that okay. Sounds good. So this is this is what we currently are using, and it's fairly polished in the sense that this is part of our calculus book. Uh, it's calculus one. What is the limit? And here we have a definition, a question. We have multiple choice answers. We check the work. I got it right somehow. Anyways, we have different. Stuff like this. This is the old system. And the way it worked was we sent some code to GitHub. The code gets sent, gets interpreted by Cake. The student goes to an OSU server, gets the cake sent, gets the cakeified version sent to them, and then they produce this on their page. However, this is the new one. I'm gonna reload it real quick. So and to, to be clear, I mean you can go to uh, maybe I'll type this in the chat as well here. My Typing is working. Maybe. There we go. Right. You can go to chimera.osu.edu. There's a lot of calculus content there. It's um ah, split slash mooculus. Oh yeah, yeah. If you scroll down to the bottom, also there's the links. So maybe that's having some typing troubles here. There we go. <laughs> Beat me to it. There's a lot of calculus content there. Um Okay, and now this this is great because now you're you're sort of showing that there's these two two different pages. Yeah, I'll here. show the other one too. This is the other page. This is the old version. Oops, I want to move that around. Uh, close that. The buttons at the top are kind of interesting. I mean, they they connect to um, the kind of page um, state, so the the student's work on the page is is saved. There's an erase button if the student wants to start over on the worksheet. Uh, there's that green bar, kind of that progress bar up in the corner. That's a that's a sort of grade um, uh, kind of view, so they the student can see how much progress they've made on the on the page. Right here, Amira definitely is rewarding uh, activity more than achievement, I would say, because you can try as many times as you want. Um, but for a fully open source tool where the answers are, you know, frankly, ultimately visible to the students, and it's not that hard, certainly for students to find the answers if they really wanted to, um, you know, I think the thing we're really trying to measure here is, isn't just straight up engagement with the tool. So the, the grading is really more about, about just measuring that, that engagement, but it does sync with the, the Canvas grade book. Uh, which I think is a certainly a very important tool because we want to, we want to make sure that we are rewarding uh, our learners for uh, you know the activity that they're that they're putting into the course here and, and engaging with with the written material, uh, you know, to reinforce some of what's happening during their uh, kind of classroom time and their in-person collaboration time. You see, there's some answer boxes down below there um, with that with that picture. That's right. And while uh, this is our new version, and while it doesn't look as uh, colorful right now, and it's not as decorated, the key thing is is that this this is not HTML. This is <laughs> this is tech being displayed yeah. in the browser, and um, that's sort of a, a marvel of uh, engineering. More, more dramatic um, if you re if you rescale the the page and then you see it reflow. <laughs> yeah, Let's see if I, can, I can't do that right now. I don't think. Ah, because of your tiling window experience. Hold on. Yeah, that's right. And make it more narrow, though, like it's on a phone. Yeah, it didn't oh, almost. Yeah. Okay, reload. Okay. 
So here you can see maybe somewhat terrifyingly, it's actually compiling. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, could could be faster. It's probably opportunity to make that make that faster. And we probably will show something else when we actually get this for uh, this is a little bit scary for the students. There it is. And you can see yeah. that it's been um, it's been re reflowed uh, to the to the size of the of the page. window. That's right. You can type in those boxes. You know, those are the those are the same as the answer blanks from from before. And they'll be hooked up to the same kind of kind of rendering. Yeah, Jason points out that um, that this is really exposing a lot of the formatting that was that was challenging um, before. And this is, I think, an interesting an interesting issue all around because a lot of people, I mean, certainly a lot of math faculty have a lot of feelings about about writing documents in in LaTeX. Uh, and they often use uh, commands in LaTeX to do uh, fiddly things to achieve certain goals. So just like putting in extra space in various places, um, you know, various people have uh, very strong feelings, I would say, about uh, exactly the, the spacing, say, around the DX in an integrand or the spacing around uh, parentheses when they mean multiplication versus parentheses when they mean uh, function application or where the colon goes in a in in the sort of type of a function, uh, you know, and this kind of spacing is is somewhat hard to uh, sometimes to communicate. Uh, it's it's difficult to communicate in in HTML. Um, it's hard to communicate in MathML even. Uh, you know, there's some definitely some frustrating points with, say, the way that Unicode encodes uh, math symbols, uh, you know, which is a little bit different than how LaTeX encodes, encodes mathematical symbols. And I don't know the, you know, the historical reasons for this, but things like Unicode has an integral sign, but there's no distinction in Unicode between a large and a small integral sign. And maybe, you know, you, I'm sure the Unicode people will tell you it shouldn't be, but, you know, but certainly, uh, I think uh, uh, the person writing the content, the author of the content, wants to have some power over how the how the content looks, and that that power that the author should have over how the content looks has to be balanced with things like, well, it's got to work on a phone, you know. So the author needs to, you know, can't really be too concerned about the actual width of the of the page. So this thing is currently designed to render at six and a half inches across if the window is wide. So if you put it on a, you know, a 40 inch uh, 4K monitor, uh, you will see that it fills up, you know, a six and a half inch region in the middle because that's a reasonable amount of, of text for you to read as, as a line of text. But if you make it narrower, it will, it will also re reflow and be, um, and, you know, be, be appropriately narrow. Um, there's also challenges around, around accessibility, which is a, a completely different issue really. Um, and it's something that LaTeX in particular makes makes quite quite challenging. Um, but the hope is that with with this improved backend, we're going to be able to also ship over to the browser um, not just the text, but also hopefully uh, some more accessibility uh, information. So things like a uh, a list, which um, in LaTeX would have a reasonable format, like begin itemized with items in between it. You know, should actually be rendered as a as a semantic HTML list on on the rendered side as well, and I think a lot of times you know authors might not might not think about that. You know, and you certainly I mean I've I've had faculty write HTML and they would not necessarily make a list into some semantic thing. They would just put BRs in between things to to break them up. Um, you know, similarly. Uh, being able to encourage faculty to do things like begin theorem to mark a theorem environment, something that we're definitely pushing people to do in the you know if they're writing Chimera documents, on the rendered side, then you know that that theorem environment is a uh, you know itself hopefully uh, you know can can be made then accessible and marked as being a, a special theorem object as opposed to just bold text at the beginning of a paragraph, which again is often what faculty might be tempted to do, you know, if they're just thinking about how the document renders, as opposed to thinking about kind of the semantic information in the in the document. And I think our ability to convince a lot of faculty to, to mark up documents, at least somewhat semantically, uh, you know, is really about striking this, this balance, because the faculty, people writing the OER are going to be comfortable with LaTeX, we're sort of banking on that. 
And we just wanna do a little bit of extra work to encourage them to write reasonable LaTeX, which will enable them to do the kind of fiddly things that they wanna be able to achieve because certainly authors have feelings about what they want their work to look like, um, but also, <laughs> Uh, you know, have enough structure so that we can make sure that we can think about things like like accessibility um, and figure out how to how to really render this in some some reasonable way uh, in the in the future. And I should point out that uh, before this talk, um, we were looking at so this is these are the same this is the same content here. And when I say they're the same content, uh, they are literally uh, it's the, the same, same source. Content. They are the same source. Uh, we, I mean, like you might look at this one and say, well, this one's in a box part and there's no box over here. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we can put boxes around it. That's fine. The issue is, can we take something that wasn't intended to be deployed this way and just do it? And we're, we're getting uh, very close to uh, these things right now. Yeah. And like the other system, this, this system is designed to plug into a grade book. So if you, if you make the window um, a bit bigger, uh, you should definitely click on, you can see Jason's got pre-calculus content in there as well. Oh yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a login button in the corner there. If you click on that login button, it's gonna connect you to a place where it's gonna record your, your grades. Um, just like on this page that says BART in the corner because BART is logged in to, uh, to the LMS. So being able to do that is uh, also a, uh, a goal of, of this, this platform. Is now a good time to ask if we have questions? Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in hearing from from folks about kind of what what they're interested in seeing uh, in, and if in you're, who if, we are in the future. If if you but, have the thought, if your question is, why aren't you doing blank, or how is this different from blank, that would be a good question to ask <laughs> because we usually can answer those questions really easily. Well, and it's just helpful to understand kind of what the there's there's a lot of possibilities you know when you're yeah. building these things and it's you just never really know where you should be headed <laughs> you know and i think compiling in the browser is good because it should make it easier for people to edit documents that's the goal right we want to make it easier for faculty to produce oer and really try to remove some of those barriers but there might be other barriers that people can think about so jason has been answering some of the questions in chat as has uh both of you, let me see if there's anything. I thought there was a question about um, a specific tool. Perusal. Perusal. Do you, do you, do you use perusal for tracking and uh, use and interaction? We we do not. Um, the the current backend does record um, interaction events using um, X API which is some, some format that uh, it's kind of like, I guess it's a caliper, like the sort of caliper uh, experience. I'm not, I haven't been super pleased with that in the current backend, um, mainly because the, uh, there's a lot of um, cost to trying to do some of the statistical analysis that, that we'd like to be able to do, uh, mainly because the logs are so, are so large. And, uh, and this is sort of a pain point for me just with, with Canvas that I really wanna have a Canvas course that has 3000 students in it. And Canvas does not seem to want me to do that and be able to open the grade book. Uh, you know, so there's, there's definitely interest in being able to just produce a highly performant kind of grade book thing that would do some of the superficial data analysis much more rapidly. And by rapidly, like, I mean, real time, you know? So like, it's the sort of thing I really wanna be able to do is just see uh, what pages are students looking at right now? What pages are they looking at in the last day? You know, and you can do that because like, I got like Google Analytics plugged into this thing. And uh, I guess Pickwick was plugged into this at some point too, but. Being able to tie that to courses, you know, the uh, is really the goal. So that's definitely something that I'm I'm we want to make sure works with the the new backend. It's just making that the kind of data analysis a lot more performant, so we can see kind of real time statistics for for student engagement. Uh, 
that means that some of the stuff that we were doing in the old back end is probably going away. So like the, the old back end had um, the ability for students to simultaneously edit uh, a worksheet on two devices simultaneously. In practice, no one's really doing that. And that, that gimmick is very expensive from a performance point of view. Um, I mean, it's cool that like every, every worksheet is a Google Doc, you know, that's a, that's a fun thing, but it's just not as important, I think, as being able to see quickly um, our student, did the students do the reading yesterday? You know, I mean, that's the kind of question I want people to answer uh, before, before class. So. Yeah, and I used to tell my students that, you know, Chimera is based on a very simple learning philosophy. That is, if you read the textbook, you're going to learn more. And so we would write the textbook in Chimera, not that one, but there would be blanks in it. And for many students, this is unacceptable that they have blanks in their textbook. So what we would do is we'd give them a PDF copy of that textbook. And inside that one, the blanks wouldn't be there. So worst case scenario, the student could sit down, read their textbook while they have the Chimera document open, and then when they get to the part, they could put the number in. Uh, while this is not the best, at least they're interacting with the textbook in some way. And having them put an answer in there uh, is a very modest uh, bar for them to jump over. I guess with, with our kind of IRB studies, you know, we, we do have statistics on the extent to which more engagement with Chimera in terms of more events logged by a user is correlated with with higher score in the course. I mean, that's you know confounded by the fact that, that the learners who are engaging with the material are, are pretty conscientious anyway, you know. But at least it suggests that engaging with the material isn't, isn't harming them, you know. I mean, the extent to which they're doing this is is you know correlates with all the other good things they're doing. I'm sure. Zachary's got a good point about I mean just the sort of uh, how we're promoting this, and I mean this is definitely a challenge. I mean, one thing that's helped is. Uh, sometimes faculty, I'll, I will find out that faculty have text notes and just without telling them, I can put them up on this website. You know, if they're on, if they're on their website anyway, they've got the text source code and then they're happy to see that there's, you know, oh, now I've got these tech notes and they look nicer. I think though, at the same time with the current back end, the conversion to HTML, because it hasn't been as authentic a, a translation of their LaTeX source. Some people are, are, you know, don't like that because it doesn't look like the PDF that they wanted to hand out to their students. So one of the, one of the hopes is that the new back end, by looking exactly like the PDF that the faculty would have produced anyway, will hopefully help with, with adoption because then they'll be like, well, this is a PDF, plus it's more accessible because PDFs are just notoriously un inaccessible. Uh, plus it's connected to the grade, you know, the grading system so I can tell if the students actually looked at it, you know, and hopefully those will be wins from, uh, at, least, at least we're beating the PDFs and the faculty who are just producing completely non-interactive LaTeX files and want to share them with their, with their learners. And as far as getting uh, faculty on board, typically it's used in large coordinated courses. And That's the main true. pain point is that faculty, uh, I think it's hard, it's not impossible, but it's harder for them to choose their own homework. So we have a lot of homework and it's harder for them to choose their own problems. In the, the new regime, that should be easier, I would think, because That's they true. should just be able to make a new repo and then delete stuff pretty easily. So I think we have time for one more question. I'm actually gonna combine two. Uh, uh, has how is this moving into higher level math classes and also outside of math? So uh, as far as higher level math classes, at least at my end, I what I typically do is I write I write a lot of content for my courses. I write a lot of course notes, and I typically always write them using uh, a Chimera friendly LaTeX, and then at some point I uh, deploy them that that's that's my my strategy and because it works well for the pdf and it's useful for me um i don't mind writing the content in that way and then just waiting to deploy it so we have advanced geometry in chimera uh i wrote some abstract algebra content uh we have a history of mathematics the... book in chimera actuarial course uh, probably what do we have complex analysis in chimera i don't know no no complex analysis. No, there, 
I mean, I, maybe it is in terms of other courses too. I mean, I, one thing that I guess I worry about is, is organic search also, and just make, cause there's a lot of people on the internet that are searching for a multiple calculus thing. They land on a Chimera page, you know, and that's, that's another kind of angle to the OER story that I think sometimes people ignore. We actually get a lot, most of the users of Chimera are, are coming through organic search and not using it in a course per se. So. Okay, so I'd like to thank our speakers, Bart Schnapp and Jim Fowler, for talking about Chimera today. Uh, we did hear about that also at 11, so if you did not make the 11 o'clock uh, session, um, we will have those recordings up available. So uh, again, Chimera was used uh, by some of the math courses for the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative Project. Um, and both Bart and Jim were involved in some of those as well. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out to them. I put their email into uh, chat if you want to reach out to them with questions. And again, I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us today. Oh, thank you, all of you, too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we will be returning at 2.15 after a short break. <laughs>